I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. Ho, ho, ho. Ooh. <laughs> That's a reference. Uh, to what? A Christmas Story. The movie with the boy who sticks his tongue on the pole? Yes. Okay. That's a tangential character in that film, but yeah. I couldn't tell you what the story's about. Oh my god. Well, when you saw it, you liked it. I'm sure I did, but I don't remember. Um... Fragile. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Kwanzaa. Yes, it is. I don't know anything about Kwanzaa. I was listening to a podcast uh, where the hosts are black. And they had commented that they don't, they're they're both black. One's African-American and one is like black from the Caribbean. And then, it's obvious what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say. But they were saying that one of them said, like, I don't know any black people who celebrate Kwanzaa. And apparently they got a lot of flack for that. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about Kwanzaa either. And I've never met anyone who celebrates Kwanzaa. Actually, I feel like I've met white people that celebrate Kwanzaa. Yeah. (laughs) Because they're the ones that do are so adamant about it. (laughs) Yeah. So I I don't know much about Kwanzaa. I just know that it's the day after um, Christmas. Jesus Christmas. I do know that's when it is. It starts the day after. We do know people. I feel, yeah. Who? There are people back in your memory. (laughs) Back in Minneapolis? Yeah. There are people that I recall saying. That they celebrated Kwanzaa, including a friend of yours. Who? Oh, uh, the one who introduced us? Yeah. Oh. There's another one. I don't know if you want to say names. I don't know. Maybe not. Well, I mean, yeah, to shame them for celebrating Kwanzaa. (laughs) Well, there are a lot of um, uh, African people in the Twin Cities, so it makes sense to me that, Mm -hmm. you know. Although, uh, I mean, I sound ignorant because I... Kwanzaa is like an African American. Yes, I I think that there's just not much of a to do though. So I don't know how much how many like black people are going around proclaiming that the you know Kwanzaa. My Kwanzaa, impression Kwanzaa. is that it's people black people who are more aligned with their African an, uh, ancestry would would be more in tune with Kwanzaa. Right, and also you don't there's no kind of uh, capitalistic support. <laughs> For, sure, for sure. So, yeah. so I, I mean, I, there are there there is a section at you know the Hallmark store with Kwanzaa cards, but <laughs> well, no, there's the mahogany section, and then they have a Kwanzaa section. Such a great but yeah, as a Black American person who also identifies as Hispanic, I feel very detached from the history of Kwanzaa, but I know that it's a thing. So happy Kwanzaa! <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, we, Christmas, we what did we do? We woke up, we watched... Uh, you were very ornery and angry with me for making you watch The Tragedy of Macbeth, and after that storm passed... Uh... Let me just say, I have a history... You know, I took Honors English and AP English. I did pass my AP exam so that I wouldn't have to take English uh, comp in a college. So I'm, I'm, I'm not illiterate, but Shakespeare was always very difficult for me. It is, it is difficult. And I... I never wanted to understand it, so I didn't study it. Well, I'm just being honest. Like, I'm not going to pretend that I'm this intellectual. Like, no, I, I, I was forced to read the standards, you know, Shakespearean standards, and really struggled and needed a lot of help and utilized cliff notes. And because of that experience, never had an interest in wanting to study it better, the language. So... I just had this impression that I don't like Shakespeare and I avoid productions like Shakespearean productions because mm-hmm. I do like <clears throat> theater, but definitely not something that I would elect to watch. So when you kept saying you wanted to watch the tragedy of Macbeth again with me. Well, cause it's in my top 10 of the year. I had no interest. And I also reread the play in anticipation of watching it again. So yeah, I, if, Anyway, it's, we it's got... a beautiful film to look at, but I don't. Well, we're going to review it, right? Yeah, I guess. I sure. Okay. So I, I saw so save my conversation about that till then. Okay. But we watched that, and then we, so we were supposed to get keys to our new house Christmas Eve, mm-hmm. but due to factors that have nothing to do with us, uh, that got delayed to the twenty eighth Tuesday. Tuesday, mm-hmm. which is annoying because we were hoping to move tomorrow but well and then what makes this more complicated is 
Los Angeles has had rain. Yeah. And will continue to have rain all week. And of course, we don't want to move in the rain. So we need to figure out a strategy for how we can move without getting all of our shit wet. I just thought of that Madonna song. Rain. <laughs> Which album is that from? Um, I don't Bedtime know. Bedtime Stories? That sounds right. Maybe. But I'd know. have to double check. Um, so, and then Christmas, we, or yesterday evening, we went and had dinner at a Japanese restaurant, a ramen restaurant in our new neighborhood. Which is really good. Which is, well, I won't say I guess right now. But, um, yeah, it was really, uh, yeah, I'll give them a shot. It was ramen Melrose. So it's a ramen yeah, restaurant. Melrose, yeah, yeah, yeah. On Melrose, uh, which was really good. I tried Japanese curry for the first time. Mm-hmm. Which honestly just tasted like if we would have gone to the Indian restaurant. So I don't know. <laughs> it was very good. <laughs> Except the chicken was like, it was like chicken tenders, mm-hmm. which I know they say is like tempura. Mm-hmm. That was just straight up chicken tenders. Yeah, for In sure. Some curry. I mean, I got technically, it wasn't called this, but it's popcorn chicken. And then you curry. got popcorn chicken ramen. To popcorn chicken ramen. Which was just like normal ramen, but then they threw some popcorn chicken. <laughs> but on it was top. well done. It, it was, was good. good. And then we got some sushi. And then you uh, got like, uh, a crab bun. Yeah, I didn't like that. Because I wasn't aware that soft shell crab... I don't eat crustaceans, period. But I didn't realize that there was a difference between like crack, cr- the crab you crack and then soft shell crab. crab. People eat that shit like... Well, they, they just literally deep fried this, this little crab and put it on a bun and expect me to put it in my mouth. And so I was eating all the joints and shit. Because I was tearing up my food, so I didn't notice you until I finally looked up I, for air. I discreetly put uh, all those parts under the bed of lettuce. And I, um, I was shocked to see that there was so much... Um, uh, well, usually I leave no food, so, you know. Well, there, there was a lot of your food left, which was interesting. Alarming. Yeah. but um, It's just like, where did we go where they had... I was all excited about that shrimp. It was some... Yeah, we went somewhere where, where you got like jump or tiger shrimp. Oh, and they were huge. They were and, huge. And I was so excited to get it. And you got it with a big pineapple. Where was that? Oh, it was at that really cool... Well, this was pre-pandemic, the... In downtown LA, the row. Yes, yeah. Where they that, have all those really cool food trucks. So that was fun, and there, you know, it, was, it t- takes forever to get it because that truck was always busy. And then I got it, and then you know, I can't eat shrimp with the 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 casing deep fried on it. Like I will take <laughs> all the flavor and seasoning is on there, and then it's crunchy and hard, and uh, that's not. I I guess I'm just white. I don't know. That's not how I. I mean, that wouldn't appeal to me either. So I don't know what to say. But anyway, we ate there, which was lovely. We scoured for dessert. Our new neighborhood also has a lot of, um, like, uh, well, it has quite a few like Japanese restaurants yeah. and Japanese bakeries, which were open thankfully Christmas evening. So we found a Japanese what a, bakery. Thank God for these non Christians. Thank God for these non Christians. Well, yeah. I'm kidding. That's supposed to be a joke. I uh, know. I feel so ignorant again because what, like, is there a main religion in J- Japan? I don't know. <laughs> are there not Christians in Japan? There are, there are Christians everywhere because of, uh, but why where? is it that they are like, like, why is it that usually, like, it makes sense to me that, um, like there are a lot of like Indian restaurants open on Christmas, but why are there a lot of Asian restaurants open on Christmas? But, I, I mean, I don't know. Now it's not even more stupid. But thankfully there were Japanese bakeries open and we got some uh, nice baked goods. And then we came home and watched our secret movie today. Yes. Now, there, there's Christianity everywhere because of the missionaries. <laughs> so it, uh, it's not that they aren't Christian. I, I think, uh, I forgot the name of it, but Shinto is one of the main uh, religions of Japan, but they also have Buddhism and Confucianism. And well, I know I'll get a nasty email about how I shouldn't talk nasty, about things I don't. A nasty know. email. No, it's you know you know that I get emails when I say something and it's like you're ignorant. You shouldn't talk about that. Well, but love the podcast. <laughs> we're we're all ignorant about some things. I mean, I'm I, very ignorant. I'll I'll let you know. But I think the glory of talking is uh, an opportunity to learn. Learn, yes, and I'm very open to learning. Uh, speaking of nasty comments, uh, we mentioned in a video. I think it was the King's Man about the dog barking. Oh, somebody was so upset. No, yes, about like, no, it was in the Lost Daughter video. Oh, the Lost Daughter video uh, about. That's why yeah. I bought a more expensive house, so I don't have to hear these dogs. 
Yeah, I don't hate dogs. In 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 fact, don't be mad at us. Be mad at our neighbors. So our neighbors, you know, these homes in the neighborhood we're currently in are very close together. Yes. Like our <clears throat> houses are literally like six feet apart with or a less. fence or, or, or less with a fence in between. And our asshole neighbors have two big ass dogs that they've like built like a, a cage Mm-hmm. In the side, uh, like on the side of their house, which is only like three feet away from our a house, small enclave. A, a li- well, yeah, well, enclave makes it sound nice. It's not next to like our living room, and they have these two big dogs in there that are locked up. And not only are they locked up in this enclave, but then there are cages in the enclave. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the dogs are like locked in the cage, and they're there twenty four seven. Yep, outside, constantly barking. Uh, and then now in this past week where there's been a lot of rain, they're just well, out in the rain. They've been quiet because they've been crying and whimpering. Well, they but... cry and whimper all night. Yeah, so it's like, it's and, frustrating. And strangely, these people also have an inside dog. But then they have an inside dog. And I know that outside dogs hate that inside dog. I mean, I would. <laughs> because, yeah. I also have video on our surve- surveillance camera of they never have their dogs on a leash. Mm-hmm. So every time they open that enclave to let the dog out for like a a walk around the yard which isn't the, which isn't that often it's not even daily i don't think it's not daily every time they let the dog out the dog runs down the street so i have lots of videos of the dog just running down the street running across the street and the neighbors screaming at them um but yeah they're the trash people not us i don't dislike dogs i just it's no. really annoying that because also the dog barks all day all night and I know these people hear it. Yeah, because they scream at it. Because they scream at it to, to shut, shut up, up and go to bed. So it's like, you know, you could alleviate this by giving the dog more space, paying the dog more attention. They have, their yard is as big as ours, front and back, which is huge. So there is a ton of space for these animals to roam. And they have them in this little corner. It really is unfortunate. And I hope, you know, we have called animal control... About a different neighbor. <laughs> and they don't really do, and, and they don't really do much. So it's just like, well, I don't know what else to do. Um, if Peter if, if a PETA representative wants to contact me, I'll give you our address and they can come on down and <laughs> do something. But anyway, moving on to Queen of the Universe. Uh huh. Episode five. The theme was bad girls. So the remaining four contestants or there, five? There are three now. That there were five. There were five. They had to perform a song, uh, like a bad girl song. Um, Which, thankfully, somebody did perform bad girls, the oh, song. Yeah. Oh, geez. So, the the five contestants, Ada Vox performed Because I Love You by Lizzo. Ronnie Kohinoor performed Bad Romance by Lady Kaka. Which was... Mm. Aria B. Cassidine did Bad Girls by Donna Summer. Lavoie okay. did Welcome to Burlesque by Cher, mm-hmm. which Vanessa Williams was like, I've never seen that movie. I don't know what that song is. <laughs> and then Greg Queen performed Girls Just Want to Have Fun by Cyndi Lauper. The best performance for me was definitely um, Bad Girls. I think Arya B. Cassidine knows all her song choices and then the song they had to write. It just really fits into her style of music. And I think that's so smart. Like, it's not about... I mean, that's for everything for everyone. Like, it's knowing how to use what you have and not focusing on what you don't. And I feel like that queen, as a person and a drag queen, seems to really know what they do well and they stick to that. Like, they stay in their lane. An example of someone who didn't was Ronnie Kohinoor. Oh, yeah. Who's gorgeous. And I have to say, since I like to talk about hair, she is wearing her real hair this episode and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. She's beautiful. Her voice is beautiful. But her style of singing is very, like, who said she sounded like Julie Andrews? Singing Bad Romance. Yeah, I mean, she has that kind of voice. And Bad Romance, as much as I don't care for Lady Gaga, I do like that song. And it has a gritty feel to it that <clears throat> she couldn't um, make her own. So she was in the bottom uh, and then was eliminated. But they had to eliminate two queens. So the other queen who was eliminated was Lavoie. Yeah. And I do think that's fair because, like I've said before, I have seen Lavoie and so have you yeah. perform live. On the same stage as Vanessa Williams. On the same stage as Vanessa Williams. Uh, she is a very talented like performer, like cabaret, comedy. 
So I don't know that her vocals are what's most impressive about her. I think as an inter- like as the total package, she's very yes, I agree, um, impressive. But just as a vocalist, no. So the top three are left. Uh, we're left with Ada Vox, Arya B. Cassidyne, and Grad Queen. I'm still so shocked how they are sending these queens home. Like <laughs> we started with 14 queens, we're only on episode five, and we have three left. Yep. They got rid of these bitches so quickly. Yep. Who do you think will win? Uh, I kind of want Ada Vox to win. I, but I don't know. It'll be all her. three are really talented. It'll be it'll be her or Cassidyne. Yeah, all the the three of them are really. I like all three, so um, I think they all deserve. And that's a lot of money, two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, it then the it looks like it's expensive. They have you know expensive ish people on their pop. Well, the what, the, what, what the, they... the production quality is high. They have dancers. The licensing for all these popular songs. What do they call? What do they? What does Graham Norton keep calling the jury? Their pop, pop diva panel. Pop diva, please. The, well, my popcorn chicken panel. Well, I mean, you know, I think Vanessa Williams and Leona Lewis are definitely qualified to judge a singing contest. I agree, but then you have Trixie Mattel and Michelle Visage, like pop diva. Well, I feel like why do we need Michelle? Why do we need Trixie Mattel when Michelle Visage is commenting on drag? And Michelle's drag commentary is better than Trixie's. Yes. So it's like, why do we need... Trixie's stuck in doing that Paul Abdul thing where I just can't be mean or nasty. Not that you need to be mean or nasty but uh, for uh, criticism, but... Anyway, moving on. Films that were released that were not covered. Journal for Jordan, which I know is directed by Denzeli. Denzeli had a big Christmas, I guess, because... Uh... Tragedy Macbeth came out, and uh, this movie he directed, which they were very scant uh, press screenings of, and I did not see it. Uh, I though I, I am interested in seeing it. I've I've heard that it isn't what you think it is, and that's all I've managed to read. So I'll be honest, I have no interest in seeing it. Although now that you just said it's not what we think it is, mm-hmm. I might. If if it's streaming, I'll put it on in the background. I, I do think uh, Michael B. Jordan is, uh, when utilized correctly, a an interesting screen presence uh, and I think he can act hmm. you're not impressed I don't know him except for black uh, nati- uh, black nativity black uh, panther oh yeah he and he's wait what's favorite. the movie he's in yeah. is it called black panther yeah he's the villain yeah I know him in that and I know which I thought he was really good in and he's in a Tom Clancy movie well that's not good what's it called though Tom Clancy's without remorse and then he's in uh I think Fruit Belt. Creed 2? He's in Creed and Creed 2. Oh, I think I've seen Creed 2. Uh, Creed, the first Creed I can do, I did not like Creed 2. And I, I think they started miswriting poor Miss Tessa Thompson on that sequel. Uh, but I do... Fruitvale Station. I don't know that. You know, that's heroin. I mean, I know what it's about. Heroin. You know, honestly, the, the biggest thing I would think of when I think of Michael B. Jordan is, you know, that show Ridiculousness on MTV that I really like? Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the co-hosts, because you know it's hosted by Rob Deerdeck, but the one of the co-hosts is Sterling Brim, the okay. black guy who just sits there and does nothing but oh yeah, mm-hmm. like makes us believe that he's uh, editing the video or something. He and Michael B. Jordan are best friends, and they used to be roommates. So I know Michael B. Jordan's been on ridiculousness. So that's usually what I think about when I think of him is that he's Sterling Brim's best friend, <laughs> and I don't even give a shit about Sterling Brim. But, um, um, you'd probably like Chronicle. Of Narnia? No, just from 20 with Dane Dennis. Oh, I could rewatch that with Nicole Kidman. What? Isn't she in that? Narnia? Con- Tilda Swinton. Nicole Kidman's on the Narnia movies? N- no. Are you sure? Yeah. Let me double check that. I don't know if that's correct. What are you thinking? <laughs> She's in a movie like that. Like, Oh, that's oh. what your golden compass is what you're thinking I'm about. thinking of the golden compass. Don't come for is me. Is that in the same universe? Are you trying to come for me? Is that in the same universe? No. Oh. Do they look the same? I haven't seen. They the have Gold- a similar vibe. I haven't seen the Golden Compass. It's it, it's like Narnia. It's a completely different author. Narnia is C. yeah, but look at Narnia C. S. Lewis. Wait, who's? Oh, that is Tilda Swinton. <laughs> but it has a similar. Mm-hmm. It has a similar vibe. Okay, well. it's two pale white ladies in a fantasy movie. There you go. Well, they like that's to do all that. you need. Uh, okay, so moving on, <laughs> American Underdog. Uh, which I don't even know what that's about, actually. I didn't cover oh, that. Okay. Uh, uh, but let me look. Well, then we'll move on to Parallel Mothers. Oh, Parallel Mothers. I was hoping we'd make time for you to watch this, because we do have a screener. I covered it out of, um, 
Venice, where Penelope Cruz won Best Actress. We also gave Penelope Cruz Best Actress at the L.A. Film Critics Association. Uh, she probably, I, she might get an Oscar nod for it. It's got some uh, surprising bits of lesbianism in it. Uh, it. It's fine. I like it well enough. I'd, I'd hope that we had been able to have a chance to talk about it, but you haven't seen it. Um, American Underdog is uh, the story of NFL MVP and Hall of Fame quarterback Kurt Warner, by the way. Well, I already watched, uh, what's the one with football? National Champions. I already watched National Champions. I don't need to watch American Underdog. There, but there was really <laughs> no marketing that I saw for American Underdog. But I do find Anna Paquin interesting. And she's in it. Okay, movies we watch for fun. There are a lot of them. So oh, okay. you watched Scream 3. Oh my god, I hated that movie. Oh, I hated it. <laughs> the only thing I know about that movie is... What's her name? The white, the Courtney Cox. Her hair is the worst hair on screen ever. I was reading because she was fucking around with David Arquette that, then, and he told her she, he gave her the idea that she should look like Betty Page. So that's yeah. that's where those bangs come from. Um, the only reason for anyone to watch this movie is for an undying love of Parker Posey, because uh, I've never seen Scream Three. Because I, as a kid, I hated Scream Two so much. Um, I don't think I've seen any Scream films except the first one. The first one's passable. Uh, I'm more familiar with the Scary Movie franchise than I am I know am you are, because the way you started describing something, like, that's not in Scream. <laughs> I know. Every time I describe <laughs> Scream, they're like, no, that's Scary Movie. <laughs> um, but yes, and Scream 4 I didn't like, which, you know, was poor. I think, I believe Wes Craven's the last film before he died. And the new, the new one's coming out next month, and it's just called Scream. Oh. Which drives me crazy, because... Histor- like as we look back how we so then yeah, we're how are we going to know the difference when we go to like the Google whatever well Scream 96 or Scream yeah, we're gonna have to 22 uh, next is a movie called Bad Johnson oh I didn't watch that no I watched it and I and I regret it that shit was terrible it's a 2014 film starring Cam Jinganje I don't think that's how you say his name but that's how I'm saying it he can correct me if I'm wrong okay uh, he's a so he, Cam plays a sex addict who uh, wishes that his penis were not, like, that his penis would leave him alone, and then he wakes up the next day without a penis, and his penis has been turned into this, like, man. How funny would this concept be post-Me Too? I think it's not subversive. I mean, it's very basic. Every, like, whoever wrote this, who wrote this? Somebody. Jeff T- 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 Tree? Tea Tree Oil? I saw that Jeff I'm, Tree Oil. on his IMDb it says his nickname is Jeffy T. Oh, well, <laughs> Jeff T- Tree Oil wrote this movie. And it's like, he's definitely not a comedian. It, it's the most basic, like, it, it's just the most basic humor. And it's, you know, for being 2014, I know language has changed a lot in the past seven years. But it feels so dated, not funny, so predictable. Like, obviously, he's going to learn a lesson mm-hmm. and then get his penis back. The end. The funniest part of the movie is the man who's the penis. Um, Which is played by who? Nick Thune. And I feel like I've looked him up before. He has a very interesting look. Also, the casting of this movie, I kind of feel like they... It's weird. Because I don't think Cam... I mean, that man... I mean, I guess... He's not an unattractive person, but I just don't think he... I don't think his casting was good. Because his character is supposed to be, like, this misogynistic sex addict. But he just comes across as a guy who's not interested in being in love. So he's just playing this game, like, well, you know, I have sex with all these women. They get feelings for me. I don't reconcile them and move on. To me, doesn't seem that... I mean, that's like every gay man. Yeah. So it, it doesn't feel that edgy i wish his character would have been a little more vile so that the lesson learned might have some impact well there's a movie with patrick wilson where something gets cut off too from like 2010 and judy greer i'm forgetting the title of it anyhow the other thing too is it's rated r but first of all we don't see any penis we don't see any nudity except breasts it's just not very like it's just not edgy in any way. To, for a movie to be called <laughs> Bad Johnson, to be rated R, to be about um, a man losing his penis, it feels very... Like, this could have been like an SNL skit. Mm-hmm. Really. But like, one that was not funny. Okay, moving on. 
born yesterday. Oh yeah, there are very few uh, best actress Oscar winners whose performances I haven't seen. I think I can count on one hand, including both that Sally Field has won, even though <laughs> I haven't seen either of Sally Field's Oscar winning performances. Which are Norma Ray in Places of the Heart. Oh, I've seen Places of the Heart because my mom. Uh, or is it Places in the Heart? Uh, that's the one where she, for her Oscar speech. You all like... You like me, you really Well, that's like the speech me. that everyone messes up. Like, she, does, she doesn't say she that. She says yes. But yeah. we all think she says that. Okay, so Born Yesterday. Born Yesterday is something I probably always avoided because I couldn't fathom who would have a better performance than Betty Davis in All About Eve for her not to have won that year. Uh, so I, I just... Oh, wait. Who's in Born Yesterday who won? Uh, Judy Holiday, and Julie Julie Holiday won Best Actress over Betty Davis and 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 Ann Baxter, who were both in the Best Actress category for oh, All About wow. Eve. But you know, everybody says about how the voters canceled the vote canceled each other out for for Baxter and Davis for Judy Holiday to have the majority. But I've realized I've never seen a Judy Holiday movie. I've never seen Adam's Rib, even though I love Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. Well, I want to hear about this performance. Is it that good? It's funny, but I, uh, it's not as good. What is this movie about? It's basically a Pygmalion, um, My Fair Lady type story about this uh, tycoon who's trying to wheedle his way into Washington, D.C., and he's kind of an idiot, but he's got money, and his girl, his woman, played by Judy Holliday, is, she's smart, but she talks like she's from the streets, and she has this high-pitched, whiny, dumb blonde voice. I was reading that this actress was... Uh, a big inspiration for Madonna. Uh, and she, it, he hires this tutor to come teach her things uh, about life and politics. Uh, and she falls in love with him. And, and that, of course, is played by William, the much better looking William Holden, because the dumpy uh, Broderick Crawford is her man. It's very predictable. She's very sweet and cute and is able to get away with something that uh, could be kind of grating. Uh Judy Holiday was only like 14 or 16 films also interestingly but yeah she's just this this best As actress Oscar win that won over these two amazing performances and I think I always kind of knew that I would think it wasn't deserving and it's not it's still worth a watch and I like William Holden too but uh, yeah interesting to we me. decided to watch Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2 the Sam Raimi's because we well, we reviewed the new Spider-Man, mm -hmm. which uh, which features Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield as their Peter Parkers. So it made me think that I don't remember. I didn't even remember the last Spider-Man film, the, the the second Tom Holland Spider-Man. So I damn sure didn't remember the Tobey Maguire movies or the Andrew Garfield movies. So we watched the first one mm -hmm. and the second one. I don't have much to say except I think Tobey Maguire is okay as Spider-Man. Uh, but I don't like this. I, he, you know, Spider-Man is just such a frustrating character because he's kind of irrational and irresponsible. And I know that's how this young man's supposed to be. It's just not very satisfying to watch. And, you know, Kirsten Dunst has been in movies I do like. I don't dislike her. I just think that She's kind of like a... Her character, her MJ is kind of trashy and I don't see why Peter Parker likes her. I don't see why anybody is so fascinated with her the way they paint her. But because yeah, then James, Franco, James Franco's character could get anyone he wants because he's rich. Well, and then she's like this Broadway star and by the second one doing a, uh, apparently a very long run of the importance of being earnest. Right, and, and it's just like, what is the appeal of this lady? Like, <laughs> But also they don't, of course, uh, bother to deal with the psychological ramifications of how she grew up like james franco's character gets more like we get a better understanding of his daddy issues with willem dafoe than we do of this woman that grew up being beat by her father like literally we hear him screaming at her in the first one and like it sounds like she falls down the stairs out the house and the kind of person who would grow up in that house and still go back to it uh yeah they they don't paint her also, watching this movie reminds me of when I was like an adolescent, like so as like a, you know, a 12 year old brown person and watching TV and movies and seeing these people who are supposed to be so desirable. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
y'all. And like in my little mind thinking like this bitch ain't shit. Like she's just like this thin lip, like <laughs> oh no ass God. having, flat ass, greasy ass hair, like crooked ass smile girl looking like a bug. And it's like, well, that's what I used to think. Like, the, like her? That, like that's it? Like everyone wants her? That this entire story is revolving around like trying to like preserve the love for this or the desire for this character not just in the spider-man movie, this but, helen of troy but yeah like looking at her in this movie is like okay i guess but well to each day de- to each they own but yeah no i agree with that but uh, and aunt may is corny in both well, rosemary harris and then uncle ben oh i excuse me I with do... his facelift and his toupee cliff robertson uh i do like cliff robertson the effects aren't that great uh, m- most of the uh shots with spider-man flying through the city just looks like a cartoon i agree so i don't think it's that great but toby Maguire, i do like his presence on screen it does make me want to watch more recent films with him he doesn't have a lot yeah so i i think i've only ever seen him he, in... he played bobby fisher in 2014 and that was his last movie before this Spider-Man? new spider-man oh wow um, i wonder what he's been doing oh you know i could always rewatch the ice storm i'm gonna email him Moving on. With Sigourney. Uh, the, uh, oh, he's in the Ice Storm? Yeah. Oh. He's the one in love with Katie Holmes in that. Moving on. Convoy. <sighs> Was I done talking about what I wanted to? Oh, well, Willem Dafoe, your new favorite actor. He's in Spider-Man. Yep. He will and come Spider-Man up. Spider-Man 2. He will come up again in this conversation, in this podcast. Um, Convoy. Yeah, I'd started it and forgot I'd started it and finally sat through Sam Peckinpah's Convoy uh, from 1978. <laughs> A movie, apparently, that Ali McGraw was so coked out and drunk out of her mind she couldn't perform, and this is the movie that made her give up drugs and alcohol. <laughs> oh. It's not very good. It's a movie that's based on a song, uh, so you all know how those go. But if you like Chris Christopherson and Ali McGraw, Burt Young's accent work is terrible. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything I really quite liked in this film. It was just... I like Peckinpah. It's, it's one of those films, it's, it's like cross of iron which he did right before this it's more interesting to learn about his behavior on set uh because he was you know drugged and doped out of his mind uh so was ill a lot so more often than not somebody else was directing a lot of these scenes i I think maybe lee marvin on convoy uh yeah it's just interesting especially if you like the 70s or any of these films but definitely not peck and pot at his height and because of his behavior on this set he didn't make another film for five years. Nobody wanted to insure him. Mm. I watched Moulin Rouge for the first time. Oh, God. The 2001 film directed by Baz Luhrmann. Mm-hmm. Uh, I... You said that most of his movies are like... Like, are, are, are very similar. In tone and... Well, you've seen Romeo and Juliet. I, I'm sure I did in high school or something i don't know i think it's just by the time we got to the great gatsby it's like oh this is a filmmaker who is not growing my my overall thought of moulin rouge is that it looks cool the 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 music is fun because a lot of recognizable stuff i think nicole kidman looks perfect for the role her voice i don't think is what's her name in that fantine oh, i don't even remember all i know is she has consumption uh, I, I think her vo- her character's voice needed to be better than Ewan McGregor's character. Mm-hmm. Well, like, he's, he's the better star. singer. Yeah. So I feel like that was not the best. But it does look beautiful, and I I would watch it again. Like, maybe in a theater. Um, I'm just never... Five the, years from I'm now. I'm never in the mood to watch that movie. I don't know why. Um, and I, I do like Nicole Kidman, but... I, I didn't think it was bad. I remember being... in I. Because I was walking in and out when you were watching this, but I remember, I do like John Leguizamo, but I remember being annoyed at what Baz Luhrmann makes him do in this. But, but or, and maybe, or maybe that's just residually how I feel about Romeo and Juliet as well. Next, uh, Shock Corridor. I rewatched, I love Samuel Fuller, and I don't know, I guess I was just in the mood. I, one day our secret film might have to be The Naked Kiss, because he did these two crazy films in the 60s these independent movies that are amazing but shock quarter is a lot of fun uh and i realized i didn't remember a lot of it because it's been years it's about this journalist who goes undercover in a psych ward to find out who killed uh an inmate 
and the only three witnesses are these other like mental patients and the cops can't get to them so he wants to win his he's he literally says i want to win a pulitzer prize for journalism so he trains for a year to be this to be this woman to to be this man who has slept with his sister and is keeps trying to like rape or molest her which gets him locked up so then he can interview these inmates uh and posing as his sister is his girlfriend who's a stripper who's played by constance towers and is very adamantly opposed to this plan uh but she she relents and she helps get him locked in there but of course then he actually does start to go crazy and he starts getting shock treatment but he does find out who the killer is which is interesting but it's sam fuller always was very interested in dealing with uh, America's problem with racism. And it's usually, uh, in a lot of his films, dealing with um, racists against Asian, or racism against Asian Americans. Uh, but there is a character in this, uh, a black man who has started to, because of his trauma, believes he's part of the KKK, kind of like that Dave Chappelle uh, skit. And it's pretty fascinating what Sam Fuller was able to kind of get up on screen in 1963 in this film. But moving on, you watched Scrooged. Yes, my <clears throat> I think was that the only Christmas theme movie we you went to bed. I watched Scrooged. So many I it's been years and I do really like it. Uh but so many wonderful people th- that were in this Wendy Malick, like I I don't know that I've seen her so young. Uh Elfrey Woodard of course. Uh who is very prominent in stuff in the 80s, but uh, I liked Alfred Wooden in this. If there's anything during uh, an ending that I would find that I do find kind of poignant, and there is a bit involving her son who won't speak, who, like the child and bruised, is mute because he saw his father murdered in front of his eyes. I find it funny how we recycle all of these themes. Uh, he, you know, he starts to be nice to people. He he offers Bobcat Goldthwait back his job after firing him. But there there needed to be a moment with his his secretary with Elfrey Woodard where he gives her something more than just helping her child to speak. But anyhow, uh, I really I did enjoy this film. The Ghost, Buster Poindexter, Carol Kane. Uh, it it's certainly worth a watch. Bill Murray doing what he does. It also feels like something that couldn't be made in the same way it is today. Oh, and Karen Allen as his love interest. It was directed by Richard Donner. I believe after, this is the year after Lethal Weapon. Hmm. I watched The Eyes of Tammy Faye. I watched that with you. You, you did? Uh, the end of it. I was oh. at, because that's the night I saw Matrix Resurrection. Uh, what do I think? I thought it was good. Yeah. It, I think Jessica Chastain does a good job, except that as someone who, Remembers Tammy Faye Baker very well and remembers her show with Jim J. Bullock. And uh, she doesn't capture the sweetness and the fragility of Tammy Faye Baker. Kind of like um, Croy Grace. Tammy Faye Mesner, I think, is how she was called before. Croy Grace Moretz playing K- Carrie. Yeah, it, it it she doesn't capture it, but I, I, I think for what it is, she does a good job. I actually thought Andrew Garfield did a really good job. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. So it was fun watching them. The story, you know, the first like half hour is kind of silly because they seem like caricatures, particularly Tammy Faye. Yeah. With the voice and the laugh. And as we start to settle into it, it feels comfortable. But then as we get to her later in her life, I think the makeup is pretty bad. Like the aging makeup is pretty bad. It just looks like... Her face is melting. Yeah. Like, like they made her three shades darker and they put like prosthetics on her that look like they're sliding off of her face. It's, well, I mean, I don't know. It's like community theater makeup. To well, me. the thing is Jessica Chastain also never looks, you know, when you look at Tammy Faye Baker, it's, she looks like she's falling apart. Right. She does look <laughs> delicate and fragile. And I think they, her makeup was never quite, they also did this thing where they put like white, under her eyebrows yes and it just was very distracting like i i I think the makeup was not good which really detracted from a performance that i think was pretty good i think her performance is good because even the second well i watched the second half but seeing it for the second time 
th- she does get those moments. She does nail a few really tender moments. But I think I was going to say, I think there were moments when I got a little emotional, but it was more because of what was happening and knowing that like Tammy Faye did support gays mm-hmm. during the AIDS the crisis. The scene where she talks to Jim J. Bullock is, uh, I thought... It's not Jim J. Bullock. Or, sorry. Uh, she she talks for the first time on ca- camera on their show to an AIDS patient who happened to be a priest. I forget his name. He's still alive. Yeah, so. he is. That was emotional, but it was more because of what the words were and, and what was happening than, I think, her actual performance. But I, I do think Jessica J- Chastain did a good job. Moving on. I would I would much rather, since it sounds like it's going to be a bunch of white ladies for Best Actress this year again, uh, I, I would much rather see Jessica nominated over Lady Gaga for House of Gucci. Ugh. I don't know. We need to conserve our time. House of... Uh, we, Maybe in a different one, I feel like we need to get a, the fact that she had to have a doctor on set because she was so psychologically well, unsound. Here, yes, because you said that, and I just think like everything we all this shit is fake. It's all just PR. It's all just like let's tell some weird story. Let's create this weird uh, feud or well, some bogus romantic relationship to get um, like uh, attention drawn to this project. Because even like how we were listening to um, Ebony and Irony and Lady Bunny was saying that she thinks the whole uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, Kim Cattrall feud is just fake. Because now Kim Cattrall is saying that she might make a cameo on. Yeah. And just like that. And I so I think, I assume everything is fake. Everything. And Lady Gaga is like the stunt queen. Well, then what happens is people, as time goes on, will say that becomes part of the mythos of right. this. Like, oh, she was... She was so deep in character, she had to have a psychiatrist on Because immediately like, what my mind goes to is Winona Ryder checking herself into a sanitarium after the House of the Spirits, after those, those torture scenes. And it's like... I don't but, believe shit. That lady showed up and stayed in her trailer and got her little bad hair makeup done and went on that set and <laughs> set her lines and went back to her little thing. Like, we're, we're not going to do this. Anyway. So but anyway. I really hope that Lady Lady Gaga does not get an Oscar slot, but who cares about the Oscars? Okay, anyway. still movies we saw for fun. Next is Pat and Mike. Oh, yes. Uh, speaking of Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, one of their, you know, they worked together nine times uh, on screen. Um, I'd never seen directed by George Cooker and it was entertaining. It has a young, uh, Charles Bronson who wasn't even going by the name Charles Bronson then as like Bronski or something, uh, with Catherine Hepburn doing her thing, playing a, an athlete, uh, a, a lady athlete as they call it. And, uh, Spencer Tracy being her shady manager, uh, it, you know, and it was written by, uh, Garson Kanan and Ruth Gordon and you know who Ruth Gordon is. No. They were also a couple, but you, you do. She won the Oscar for Rosemary's Baby. I don't know who that is. The old lady next door that gives her the drugs. I so know there's get, an old lady So next she can door. get raped by the devil. That's Ruth Gordon. Okay. I mean, I couldn't pick pick her out of a lineup. Harold and Maude. I've seen that movie. She's the Holocaust survivor in Harold and Maude. She's Maude? Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't have known that. Okay, well, anyway. Pat and Mike was interesting. <laughs> Lastly, I watched The Power of the Dog. I uh, thought it was excellent. Yes, I took some convincing, but I got you to watch that. I thought it was excellent. Well, I I, I only agreed to watch it because you said there's a queer component. Mm-hmm. And I thought the the movie's very smart. Um yeah. I feel like it deserves its own we're running out of time, so but yeah, I think it's excellent. I would recommend it. I thought the character Benedict plays and his relationship with his, I guess, nephew, uh step nephew is pretty powerful Mm -hmm. and complex so i can't get into it now but i did think it was excellent i would recommend it okay moving on to projects of interest oh lay lay le scene le 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 scene uh it's a new christa the 14th film directed by christophe honore uh starring juliette binoche uh plot is being kept under wraps but i think that's about to start filming Okay, and then Shirley John Ridley. John Ridley is directing a movie about Shirley Chisholm starring Regina King. Oh, okay. I'd be interested in that. You just read this shit out loud without any kind of... Well, we need to keep it moving. Okay. Uh, okay, there. unfortunately there is an entry in the obituary section. No. Okay, we got cut off, so I don't know where we ended. You, um, were, you were just introducing the secret film. The secret film. I, but just in case I didn't, uh, the obituary section... 
<clears throat> Joan Didion mm -hmm. is an entry, unfortunately. She passed at the age of 87. Yes, and if you haven't read Joan Didion, uh, highly, highly recommended. Um, you know, also a screenwriter. Um, her uh, journalism, there are collections of uh, things she's written on t in certain time and places that she's covered. It. She's a fascinating person and, uh, you know, an excellent writer. You know, a very wry personality. All right, so the secret, the not so secret film, since anyone who knows, uh, wait, say that again. Did you want to talk about Power of the Dog? Oh, now that we have extra time, the recording got cut off, so now I have extra time. Well, I can circle back to the Power of the Dog. <laughs> okay, because I wanted to talk about what I read this week too. Oh well, then here. So we're so now we're backtracking. So forget the secret film. Okay, so Power of the Dog. Uh, what did you read about it? Well, can I tell the basic story? It's about two brothers in like the 1830s mm -hmm. who um, they have a, like they're rich cause they own like a, like a cattle ranch or something. And the one brother falls in love with this like lady who runs like a restaurant. So she's kind of like lower class and she has a like 17 year old son who's clearly gay. And Benedict Cumberbatch plays the other brother. So the one who's not falling for the restaurant lady who's played by Kirsten Dunst. And initially, Benedict is making fun of the gay boy. But to just wrap it up, we find out that he actually is drawn to him because it would seem that he's gay. Or, or if, if not gay, then maybe he, he had an intimate relationship with a man named Bronco Henry. Mm -hmm. And this man taught him everything he knows. Mm -hmm. So now... Benedict wants to sort of be Bronco Henry for this little teenage gay boy who actually is now in like medical school, basically. Yeah. So they kind of have this connection. But to spoil the film, the little gay boy inadvertently or maybe not inadvertently kills Benedict. I think it's pretty clear it's in it. It's it's it is advertent. <laughs> He did it on purpose. Yeah, to save his mom. Yes, yeah. But the ambiguity of it is enough that it's like, oh shit. Mm -hmm. like, so anyway, what did you read about this film? I didn't I was I was talking about completely separate things that I read. Oh. <laughs> well, now we just started talking about the power of the dog. Well, you said you wanted to. This is a mess. Now I'm off track. Uh well. I think, uh, so I'll just continue with Power of the Dog. This episode is going to be the longest one ever. Um, ever. Well, it will be. It'll be more than an hour. Uh, what I found so interesting about this film is because I was listening to a podcast this morning with these two straight guys who had a gay guy on. And they were talking about sexuality and how, like, do we, do we think that, like, bisexuality is real? Mm -hmm. Like, that someone could have, like, right in the middle equal attraction to both genders. And my, I would say that I don't know that that applies because if sexuality is a spectrum, I, you know, so is gender. So I think... Well, and like propinquity, like... A lot of things influence... If you're someone who's more sexually free, then I think you understand that, like you said, even propinquity. And there are many factors that will allow myself, yourself, many of us to find someone sexually appealing mm -hmm. or romantically appealing and i think when you think about like man and woman it's like well but you know there are people who are non-binary people who are trans who we could also be attracted to so i think it's it's more complex than that and i and i think you know when you talk about people who are of a certain age like the boy in this movie is young although at the point where he's interacting with benedict he's 18 mm -hmm. but you know, the relationship they have seems to be more of like a, it's, it seems like he's drawn to him physically, but mm -hmm. also like, also he wants an intimate relationship with him and to mentor him the way. And I feel like it made me uncomfortable because part of me thinks like you're trying to groom this boy because mm -hmm. the point in the, there's a plot point that Benedict's character is very, um, like he has a lot of like common sense and worldly um, abilities, but he's not particularly intelligent. Right. And the little gay boy is very smart. <clears throat> so it's like he's trying to groom this boy who knows better. Like this boy can see right through him. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of creepy to watch this man try to groom this boy. 
But then there's some relief in knowing that this boy is not going to be fooled by this man. He won't be manipulated. And ultimately gets done up by this boy because <laughs> he kills him by having him uh, handle anthrax, basically. But yeah, I thought that was a really sophisticated story. A very strong uh, directorial job. Oh, it's Jim Campion. I mean... Yeah. And uh, I think the acting was strong. My least favorite character was the guy from Antlers. The guy from Jesse Plemons. The guy from Antlers. And, and I think he did a fine enough job. It just... He was very, like... He's been in so much. He was unnecessarily meek for my taste. Sure. Um, he is also, like... It's kind of going the way of, like, Vincent D'Onofrio, where it's like, are we trying to become Orson Welles? Well, I've seen him in a few things, and he's kind of the same, and... Yeah, his look lends itself to being, like, kind of... I mean, I guess he fits the characters he plays, but... I do like him. Anyway, I, sorry. Before we get to the secret film, you wanted to talk about two things Oh, because, um, you know, I said I'd reread Macbeth this week, and it made me realize I never read Hurley Burley. Because, you know, there are a ton of lines in Macbeth that have been used as titles that are more or less or not related at all to the plays uh, or books that... They're titling. Uh, but I never read David Rabe's Hurley Burley, for which, uh, you know, I have a copy of because uh, Sigourney Weaver performed that on Broadway in 84 and received her, I think that's her only Tony nomination. So I read that. It really doesn't have anything to do with Hurley Burley, but, or with Macbeth. But David Rabe's afterward talks about how he came to name it, give it this title. And I, because I kept trying to figure it out, and... He doesn't bring up the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech, which is what I thought the, his hurly burly was all about. The whole time I was thinking, it's like it's that po- that moment where Macbeth says, "Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player, blah blah blah," told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Because that's what I felt like. This is about these four awful, horrible men and the three different women that are used by them in Hollywood, in okay. the hills, in the eighties. Uh, anyhow, but that also led me to read another play I've been sitting on that Sigourney had mentioned in late 2020. She wanted to be in a film production of it. And I don't know if it's happening. It's called Our Daughter Keeps Our Hammer Ugh. by Brian Watkins. I like that title. It was, it, the play is only like 52 pages and I believe it was performed at the Flea, which is owned in New York, which is owned by uh, Sigourney's husband, Jim Simpson. And it's set in East Colorado on some farm country in the plains. And it's just about these two sisters who take care of their ailing mother, whose best friend is a sheep named Vicky. And basically how the sisters go into a rage and like kill this damn sheep and burn it to death. Uh, <laughs> it is. And it's just this two sisters talking who are no longer talking to each other. So it's, it's written in a way that if you saw it on stage, they'd be talking to the audience and not each other relating to very different instances but that was very entertaining and i don't know if that that will get made into a film but oh the things you know i have a running list of all the projects that Warney says were going to happen or not happening and the next thing you read that's it oh i thought there were two those are the two things oh okay were you listening yes <laughs> clearly okay our secret film Joseph's pick. What I was trying to say is I still think it's funny that we keep saying secret, but the title of the podcast... Well, you do that. You... I, I know. The title of the podcast episode is The Secret Film, but that's kind of in line with my personality. Um, <laughs> it makes no damn sense. So, Speed, the 1994 film directed by Jan DeBont. Jan DeBont. Jan DeBont. Do we know who this person is? Yes, I told you last night. He was a cinematographer. You, you've seen his work. I, I believe he shot the film Roar. Oh. Yes, he's been with, around. With um, uh, Tippi Hedren. Me- Melanie Griffith? And her mother, Tippi Hedren. Okay. Uh, so but- why did I choose this film? Because I had said I'd never... Oh, I know why. Because I was listening to the podcast Smartless, and they had Sandra Bullock on it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know if the Sandra Bullock beehive is listening, but I don't care for that lady. I didn't care for her in her in that podcast episode. She seems very smug and like she is not it seems like acting is not even something that she really cares about. I do like her, but I it might be also nostalgia for while you were sleeping. I don't even know that movie, but 
The only I don't rec- I don't remember her from anything except oh, and the Blind me. Side. Well, that's crap. And Gravity, which I did enjoy. Gravity's great. And I do need to rewatch. And the Unforgettable, the Unforgivable, the Unforgivable, which was terrible. Her and Keanu both have new movies this month. And then I didn't. I don't. Re- the only thing I remember about Miss Congeniality. I do like Miss Congeniality, the first one, and Regina King. Before you is, say Regina King, is, is only in the second one. Is Regina King? So then I guess I only remember the second one, and the second one's in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. and there is a drag performer named. I want to say his name because I used to see him all the time when I lived in Vegas. He does a uh, Tina Turner impression, like he's a Tina Turner illusionist. Hmm. I'll find his name and say it. But um, that's all I know about her. Oh, and then that movie with Ryan Reynolds, and I couldn't stand her in that. The proposal's not good. Yeah. So listening to her in the podcast, uh, I, I I really didn't like her at all. Uh, so then it made me want to watch Scream because she was telling stories about Scream. Speed. Speed. <laughs> you know why? Because I'm thinking, I'm picturing Sandra Bullock in my head, and she could be Courtney Cox to me. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, she's... I I do I like Sandra Bullock, but oh Larry Edwards, Larry Edwards is the gentleman who works as a Tina Turner impersonator, who I would see in Vegas all the time. That's when I think about Sandra Bullock and Miss Congeniality, all I think about is Larry Edwards. So I'm really not checking for this lady. But anyway, we watch Speed, which is streaming on HBO Max. What about Practical Magic? I don't know what that is. Where she's witch with Nicole Kidman? No. And Diane Weist and Sucker Channing? I would watch that though. That I remember how only for Diane Weiss though. <laughs> Stalker, you wouldn't watch her for Stalker. Uh, I like Diane Weiss the best of all those people. Same, but you know. Uh, so okay, Speed is it was a big hit, I re- and I can appreciate why because in the mid nineties, like th- I mean, the film does feel like an adrenaline rush, right? Like it, it really does. It's a thrill ride. It is a thrill ride, but boy. Th- this shit so I so my memories of this I think we had just gotten cable okay and this was the new movie on HBO so this is probably sometime in 95 and my parents my dad was so excited to watch this and he hated this movie I just remember screaming at the television about how dumb it was because it is and let that's me, the last time I've seen it let me tell the movie okay. so Dennis Hopper plays an ex cop like an, an ex bomb squad an ex LAPD o- Atlanta officer. Oh, was it Atlanta? He was in Atlanta, I think. Oh. Anyway, he's an ex-law enforcement person who had an injury and got, like, let go from his job. So he also didn't get his pension. So now he's mad. So he's decided that he's going to, like, hold, like, an elevator filled with people hostage to get, like, $3.7 million. And Keanu Reeves and Jeff Daniels play like bomb squad guys, mm-hmm. and they go and foil his plan. They're just cops. They're not even bomb. Oh, they're, oh, they're just cops. Jesus. Um, so they foil Dennis Hopper's plan. Oh no, that's not true. Sorry. Okay, so they are bomb squad people. Yeah, because Jeff Daniels yeah, knows yeah, all yeah. about bombs. Yeah. So they foil Tom De- Dennis. Tom, Tom Dennis. What's his name? Dennis Hopper's plan. Tom. Dennis. So he goes, and then he fakes his own death, kind of. And then he goes underground for two years and then he pops back up and basically puts a bomb on a bus and then calls Keanu to tell him. Well, he blows up another bus in front of Keanu, which is also like how he timed that is strange. No, well, that time is ridiculous, but more in Venice, right? I don't understand how. Well, let me just finish. He puts a bomb on a bus and then tells Keanu if if this bus hits 50 miles per hour it'll set off the bomb. And if the bomb goes under 50, it'll explode. So you need to give me this, you need to give me this $3.7 million or the bus is going to explode. Obviously they're able to get everyone off the bus. And then they give Dennis Hopper the $3.7 million, but then he, he's able to escape with it. Mm -hmm. So now there's like this fight. There are like three movies in one, which we'll get into. But obviously they're able to... Um, he takes Annie hostage, which is Sandra Bullock. Which is Sandra Bullock's character. But, you know, obviously the bad guy gets uh, killed. Decapitated. And, and yeah. the good people, Sandra Bullock and... The good people. Keanu Reeves make it. Jeff Daniels does die. Yes, and there is one death on the bus. And uh, there's there are two deaths on the bus. Or just one. Beth Grant. 
from Tu Wang Fu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, so there are just two. Yeah, she's the only one who dies. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So should I just go through my notes? <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't take any note. That I just let the stupidity of this wash over me. So I didn't know anything about this film except it was about a speeding bus. So the film opens... There are three different stories Mm -hmm. because there's this movie set in an elevator where like someone's holding these people hostage on an elevator and these cops, bomb squad people have to get them out. Mm -hmm. There's that part of the movie, which they rectify. Then there's the speeding bus with a bomb on its storyline, which is like, you know, and like 45 minutes of the film or longer. It felt longer. And then they resolve that. And then there's this whole plot point of, Dennis Hopper's character getting away with the money and now Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves are stuck on a subway train that has an that, unfinished track that has a nut that has an unfinished track which is the second unfinished uh, roadway that we've encountered in this movie and them trying to get off of that mm-hmm. so it just feels like a lot is going on but the opening of the film we see Dennis Hopper's character pretending to be like a repair person on the elevator and a security guard confronts him and Dennis Hopper stabs the security guard in the ear with like a screwdriver mm-hmm. and I was kind of shocked like I didn't realize that with this that's what this movie was so it started off on a good note like oh well Dennis Hopper gives you good villain I mean <sighs> sure I, I, I think it's a one note the movie. dialogue is crunchy from everyone I agree the but, dialogue is bad but I do think again Dennis Hopper walks away with something a little more salvageable comparably sure Okay, so in the first part of the movie when they're in the elevator and everyone knows the elevator is dropping to the bottom floor. Like they're on the 45th floor and it's going to make its way to the bottom, right? That's like worst case scenario, the elevator drops. And all these law enforcement agents are standing at the bottom of this building right in front of the elevator. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the elevator does drop. Yeah. The people in it are saved. (laughs) But the elevator drops and when it hits the bottom, of course, the elevator bank explodes and all these people go running. Like, why would you stand at the bottom like that? (laughs) So I just realized watching this film last night that there's a popular saying or quote from this movie that I've heard many times over the years where Dennis Hopper's character says, pop quiz, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 is doing this. What are you going to do? And he says it twice. Then Keanu says it to him. I never realized that was where it comes from this film then when dennis hopper is explaining why he's doing this like what like why he's put this bomb on this bus he tells keanu like you ruined a man's life life's work (laughs) yeah yeah for real which is why i think dennis hopper is kind of funny and everybody else is ooh. okay sandra Bullock as this character Annie. Oh, are you about so to talk about how she looks? Fucking annoying. Oh, I'll just get it out of the way now. Sandra Bullock looks like the lady monkey from Planet of the Apes. <laughs> so which one? Kim Hunter or Helena Bottom Carter? Depending on your plan. I of think the Apes. Helena Bottom well, both. Okay. Just because it's that hair and that nose. Mm-hmm. And then I thought if you mix the if you mix the <laughs> Well, I'm not going to say that. That's too oh, okay. Mean. But, I, I but yeah, think Sandra Bullock looks like the the monkey lady from Planet of the Apes. I think her hair is terrible. I hate her hair. But I again, I think she's a beautiful woman. But I don't. I I don't feel that way about her. But she that character is so annoying. It she is. She is. It's like I want that bus to crash. When they when, when <laughs> I want that bus to explode. When we have to listen to these people talk about. LA shit before the the action starts going down. It's like, oh, this is written by somebody that has not been on public transportation. Oh my god! Uh, yes, the, the the banter on the bus. Because n- nobody's asking for you to explain why you're on the bus. Because you got one person being like, I can't drive on the freeway a- anymore, and I miss my car. Like, ugh. When Keanu sees the bomb under the bus, he's like, "There's enough C4 in this thing to put a hole in the world." Oh god, yeah, this script is <laughs> bukaka. As I was watching this movie, I'm like, what the fuck could Speed 2 be about? And then we put on Speed 2 right after this, and we watched like half an hour? Oh, well, see, I gotta finish it, because I can't just watch half of something, but it's worse. Speed 2 is... I only watched the first half hour. I will finish it. That shit was atrocious. It's worse. It's also Yann DeBont, who would go on to do The Haunting and I think a Lara Croft movie. The only thing about this movie I thought was interesting is the commentary on how the media is so involved in police, like official, uh, like official police business. Like, why do we have helicopters following like high speed chases or they're at the crime scene and it's like, or when there are like 
any kind of investigation and the media is all over it, giving details, it only hinders law enforcement. Mm-hmm. And we've seen it time and time again in like um, police dramas of all sorts, TV, movie, where it's like the media is really hindering the police's work. And while I think that transparency is important, right, because clearly with the age of technology, we have proof now how the police treat certain demographics. And I think that's a very positive side effect. It just is like, yeah, the only, I mean, we do find out because there comes a point when Keanu's character says like, you need to get these helicopters away because that's how Dennis Hopper's character knows what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But then we find out Dennis Hopper's character put a camera in the bus. With no sound though. With no sound. But anyway, I I, I did think that was interesting commentary. Like we, this like sort of um, phenomenon of the media being involved in these things and how people think they should know what's happening and people being nosy, like, cause you know, that were happening even now when there are high speed chases and they're on. Oh, people t- tune in. People not only tune in, they will go and like, like go to the street, the chase is happening, on, hoping they can get a glimpse. Yeah. And it's like, okay, stupid. So when that bus blows up and you're standing there because you're a looky-loo, like, it makes no damn sense. And it's funny because I think we were trying to place when this filmed in relation to the OJ chase. Right. Which it obviously filmed before that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm positive that had this been made after that, there would have been direct reference to OJ. There's a character in the film called Ortiz. He's one of the passengers on the bus. He's a... a like a large, like tall... Played by Carlos Carrasco. Latino man who, uh, at one point, Keanu's character calls him Gigantor. Yeah, because like just does, out of nowhere. And he's like, my name's Ortiz. He's like, my name is Ortiz. <laughs> um, Keanu's performance. Ke- uh, can we mimic Keanu's voice? Like... He sounds so... He un- talks... He talks like this. It's haltingly, but it's... It's, uh... It, yeah. It's so inauthentic, too. Like... <laughs> he sounds plastic, but... Yeah. Uh, like maybe over the years I've just grown accustomed to it because I do like him. I do like him, but uh, but his acting is not very dynamic. I mean, this is this is kind of fresh off getting clocked for his accent work in Francis in Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> uh, he was a heartthrob then. I do recommend uh, My Own Private Idaho, but yeah, it's, oh, I need to rewatch that. It, actually, it's uh, and my mom because my parents were bitching about the matrix resurrections and she's like i prefer john wick i'm like well that those films don't really need him to speak yeah he's not talking in those <laughs> well, well, long, that's why you like it better <laughs> a lot of swaths of dialogue but even watching i think he's grown better with age but he's so stiff and rigid in this and all i kept thinking was poor joe morton who's playing the police captain he would have been a better choice for this character. Yeah. He's much more charismatic. Yeah, more yeah. Yeah. Uh and then you got all these like people on the bus like Alan Ruck playing this nerdy character, um Hawthorne James as the bus driver. Who is the handsome guy on the bus? Who which handsome man on the He had like the center part and Are you talking about Alan Ruck who I just talked about? Is that who that is? From Ferris Bueller's Day Off? No. Th- this guy's better looking than him. Oh, with the earring. Yes. Who also has bad dialogue. No, I don't know who that is. Uh, okay. So and then Glenn Plummer. Glenn Plummer. As the Jaguar oh, as the owner. the Jaguar owner. Who's in, the, who's in Speed 2 somehow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so on the bus, they're told, because they get on a freeway that's like not open yet. So they have like several miles of free road. But then they're told, oh, the freeway ends. So then there's this like 50 foot gap. And then mm-hmm. the bus like jumps the gap. I thought that was a fun scene because that shit looks so crazy. But then the same thing happens at the end when they're on the subway train. Mm-hmm. They hit the end of the subway line and they jump. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> this shit is so dumb. One part I did think was really cool is once Keanu finds out Dennis Hopper is watching them through surveillance in the bus, they somehow get the media to like loop mm-hmm. the video transmission. So now Dennis Hopper just sees... Uh, a one minute clip being played repeatedly and that gives them a little extra time to get people off the bus. And then when Dennis Hopper realizes it's a loop, he blows up the bus, but it's too late. I did think there is enough tension and there's enough going on that I, I was engaged. I I just think the film feels really long because there are three different like moments that are all the same. 
Yes. Like the exact same tension. That had the exact same problems yeah, that are thrown at them. Problem. Like it's so dumb. Uh, yeah. And Speed 2 Cruise Control, I, you know, have never seen. I remember, I remember the marketing for it, which is pretty heavy in 97. Uh, but I also remember somebody writing in one of the trades, or I don't know if it was Entertainment Weekly, saying like, nobody wants to shell out to see a Jason Patrick movie. <laughs> Yeah, he's not. He's a handsome man, but he wasn't giving me anything in Speed Two. And Sandra Bullock is more annoying. Well, the character's not good, and they they've written her as this clown, which of course. She, you know, but that's a, her stick. In I a think part of her career, that's what she played up. Yeah. She well, because even listening to her podcast on Smartlist, her episode on Smartlist, it's like I think she sees herself as like a comedic actor, mm-hmm. but then she's downplaying that she's like considered attractive but i think that's what she's banked on like oh i'm pretty Mm -hmm. and i'm funny but i don't think she's that pretty or funny at that point in the 90s they were trying to groom her i believe to be a replacement for julia roberts who was in a string of flops you know i know you don't care for julia roberts i i do like julia roberts from the 90s like and i i do think she does have a personality and a and a energy and a smile like an aesthetic that i that i think fits her sort of like rom-com America sweetheart sure but Sandra Bullock I just I don't know she rubs me the wrong way I yeah you were so bothered at that that podcast I don't know she's just smug and then like her family like her mom and dad are both very successful musicians I think her mom is like an opera German opera and then her dad is uh, like an op like an opera coach and you know they seem to have resources and she grew up in germany and the u.s and just the way she talks about everything and talks about money and talks about her career is like uh, she seems like someone who if she fell on hard times i'd be like well that's what you get <laughs> she won't fall on hard times she's, she won't she, i think she's she sounds very smart and she's planned for herself but um she she i think it was more of the comments of how is this going to be my last film or my last project she's it's kind of like robert downey jr who doesn't do independent film like it's not about your love for the, of the craft, which I think is what's disappointing when you really like. Sure, somebody. yeah, I you know what I think that's what it is. I think she she her she seemed very inauthentic talking about her career and how flimsy it is because it's like, bitch, we know your bank account is full, we know that you will always work. Like you're Sandra Bullock, but not that I you will you will never not be without work. But 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 she's talking like, oh, it could be my last project, and I can't believe people hired. I and really? I don't I I don't want to hear people feel like they're desperate. To, you know, I, I think the, the stories about actors and actresses, actors that are run into the ground because they run out of work is, is is sad. But I think it's more out of respect to those people that don't have that as an option. Right. And I don't want her to sound like that either. But I think it's like she she just I don't know. I just I, I want to be like Sigourney Weaver, you know, says she wants to be like Margaret Rutherford. And she has fan, like she fantasized about dying in the middle of a take. Like, like, oh, you, I like, when, you like what you do. You I know? like when successful actors, or really anyone successful, is like, yeah, like, I'm very lucky and I worked hard to have this career and I hope I can continue to do what I love. But it's like, don't act like, you know, your money is... I, I, I just don't like that. And she just didn't seem like she loved acting. It just seems like it's a job. And then all she kept talking... You know, the other thing, too, is like... And people probably don't like this, but I get so tired of hearing about people and their kids, like... You know, if you make a decision to be a parent, that's a like that's your big responsibility. Mm-hmm. Like we know. So then, when people go on and on about how like that, because she says like everything I do now is so that I can spend the most time with my children, and it's like, well, that shouldn't be hard because you're worth probably hundreds of millions of dollars. You could never work again. Mm-hmm. So the fact that you even take one job a year is like, well, come on, girl, you could literally stay at home every day. If you wanted to with your kids, you choose not to. And I feel like it's kind of a slap in the face to like, well, regular ass Annie Mae over here working at, you know, uh, Costco, having to balance motherhood and her work. Sure, sure, sure. It it just feels kind of like, lady, no, I don't want, like, she just spent a lot of time talking about her kids and just my kids, my kids, everything about my kids. It's like, you don't have to be here right now. You could literally take your ass to Ohio and buy a big ass compound. Sure, but and spend all your time with your kids. So to get on these people's podcasts 
and talk about how like you I'm like ranting for nothing but you I'd, are ranting for nothing but I get because <laughs> you have to remember this is her perspective and she's trying to show you're humility. right she's trying to show humility uh, and I think and it, that's the problem don't like it's like pretend humility is how I feel sure that's why well I'm, I'm, I'm on a rant because you asked me why I don't like you commented that I don't care for her it's just like I, I mean it's, she's such a, a <laughs> innocuous person to not care for. <laughs> like I, I like my celebrities to either be very over the top. Sure. Like, I don't like Mariah Carey's music, but I like her as a celebrity because she's very over the top. It makes me think if anyone should have money, mm-hmm. it should be Mariah Carey. Okay. Or Nicolas Cage. Or, you know, people who are very extravagant. Or, just be like, I don't know, like hearing Meryl Streep talk, who, and again, I'm not like the big Meryl Streep fan, but it's like, she sounds like someone who's like, I know I'm fucking Meryl Streep, Mm-hmm. I know that I can do whatever I want, mm-hmm. and it's cool. Like here, like here we are right now. Or like when you know, I did get to interview Isabelle Huppert, and before I started the interview, tried telling her what a fan I'm in, and she just kind of like shushed that away. She's like, "I don't even want to hear that. I know." Yeah, it's <laughs> like, like like I already know you feel that way because you're here. Yeah, I, I I just I don't know. i this has become the Sandra Bullock podcast episode. <laughs> But <laughs> anyway, I what, like what I wanted to get in there, though, was I thought you'd be more excited to watch Speed 2 Cruise Control since you've just declared to the world that your favorite actor is now Willem Dafoe, who is the villain in that. Oh, I absolutely want to finish it. I was just tired. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, but the movie's terrible. It's really, it's garbage. But Willem Dafoe is, I mean, he's, he's so fun to watch. He is, well, yeah, I mean. So that's, I mean, that's enough for me, but. Again, again also a person that gives good villain. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you have anything else to talk about? No, I don't know who's going to listen to this 90-minute podcast. But I know. Go. I know. This, I might have to cut this one up. I don't know. You got to cut it. Do you have a quote for us? Oh, yeah. I had a Joan quote for you. A short one, I guess. Joan Didion. Yes. Um, where was Joan it? Rivers. Oh, no. just I mean, she has, a lot of, there's, she has a lot of brilliant things she says. The one I, that I landed on that I liked was, Grammar is a piano I play by ear. Oh, well, look at that. You'd, you'd like Joan. We have a few Joan books. Uh, well, since I said Joan Rivers, here's a Joan Rivers quote. Oh, God. People say that money is not the key to happiness, but I always figured if you have enough money, you can have a key made. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> uh, we're probably going to... I feel like this week we're not going to have a lot of videos because we'll be in the middle of moving. Well, there's not a lot coming out this week. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, because I don't know where we'll film in the midst of trying to move. We do have a nicer space, mm-hmm. um, so I'm sure we'll have a nice setup for recording things. I'm looking forward to that. Same. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's all I have. Anything else? No. Nope. Bye. <laughs> Bye.